Are we ready for chapter five? We're going to be reading the first half of chapter five in Little Women this morning by Louisa May Alcott. We are here at the Caribou Public Library. I'm Miss Erin. I'm so glad that you're here joining us for our chapter book story time. All right, so chapter five is called Being Neighborly. Let's see what happens. What in the world are you going to do now, Joe? asked Meg one snowy afternoon as her sister came clumping through the hall in rubber boots, old sack and hood, with a broom in one hand and a shovel in the other. Going out for exercise, answered Joe, with a mischievous twinkle in her eyes. I should think two long walks this morning would have been enough. It's cold and dull out, and I advise you to stay warm and dry by the fire as I do, said Meg with a shiver. Never take advice. Can't keep still all day. And not being a pussycat, I don't like to doze by the fire. I like adventures, and I'm going to find some. Meg went back to toast her feet and read Ivanhoe, and Joe began to dig paths with great energy. The snow was light, and with her broom, she soon swept a path all around the garden for Beth to walk in when the sun came out and the invalid dolls needed air. Now the garden separated the March's house from that of Mr. Lawrence. Both stood in a suburb of the city, which was still country-like, with groves and lawns, large gardens and quiet streets. A low hedge parted the two estates. On one side was an old brown house, looking rather bare and shabby, robbed of the vines that in summer covered its, rows, its walls and the flowers which then surrounded it. On the other side was a stately stone mansion, plainly betokening every sort of comfort and luxury, from the big coach house and well-kept grounds to the conservatory and the glimpses of lovely things one caught between the rich curtains. Yet it seemed a lonely house, <clears throat> lifeless, for no children frolicked on the lawn, no motherly face ever smiled at the windows, and few people went in and out, except the old gentleman and his grandson. To Joe's lively fancy, this fine house seemed a kind of enchanted palace, full of splendors and delights, which no one enjoyed. She had long wanted to behold these hidden glories and to know the Lawrence boy, who looked as if he would like to be known. And if he only knew how to begin. Since the party, she had been more eager than ever and had planned many ways of making friends with him. But he had not been lately seen, and Joe began to think that he had gone away when she one day spied a brown face at an upper window, looking wistfully down into their garden, where Beth and Amy were snowballing one another. That boy is suffering for society and fun, she said to herself. His grandpa doesn't know what's good for him and keeps him shut up all alone. He needs a lot of jolly boys to play with or somebody young and lively. I have a great mind to go over and tell the old gentleman so. The idea amused Joe who liked to do daring things and was always scandalizing Meg by her queer performances. The plan of going over was not forgotten, and when the snowy afternoon came, Joe resolved to try what could be done. She saw Mr. Lawrence drive off, and then sallied out to dig her way down to the hedge, where she paused and took a survey. All quiet, curtains down at the lower windows, servants out of sight, and nothing human visible but a curly black head leaning on a thin hand at the upper window. There she, there he is, thought Joe. Poor boy, all alone and sick in this dismal day. It's a shame. I'll toss up a snowball and make him look out, and then I'll say a kind word to him. Up went a handful of soft snow, and the head turned at once, showing a face which lost its listless look in a minute, as the big eyes brightened and the mouth began to smile. Joe nodded and laughed and flourished her broom as she called out, how do you do? Are you sick? Laurie opened the window and croaked out as hoarsely as a raven. Better, thank you. I've had a horrid cold and been shut up a week. I'm sorry. What do you amuse yourself with? Nothing. It's as dull as tombs up here. Don't you read? Not much. They won't let me. Can't somebody read to you? Grandpa does sometimes, but my books don't interest him. and I hate to ask a brook all the time. Have someone come and see you then. There isn't anyone I'd like to see. Boys make such a row and my head is weak. Isn't there some nice girl who'd read and amuse you? Girls are quiet and like to play nurse. I don't know any. You know me, began Joe and laughed and stopped. So I do. Will you come please? cried Laurie. 
I'm not quiet and nice, but I'll come if mother will let me. I'll go ask her. Shut that window like a good boy and wait until I come. With that, Joe shouldered her broom and marched into the house, wondering what they would all say to her. Laurie was in a little flutter of excitement at the idea of having company and flew about to get ready. For, as Mrs. March said, he was a little gentleman and did honor up and did honor to the coming guest by brushing his curly pate, putting on a fresh collar, and trying to tidy up the room, which, in spite of a half a dozen servants, was anything but neat. Presently there came a loud ring, then a decided voice asking for Mr. Laurie, and a surprised-looking servant came running up to announce a young lady. All right, show her up. It's Miss Joe, said Laurie, going to the door of his little parlor to meet Joe, who appeared looking rosy and kind and quite at her ease with a covered dish in one hand and Beth's three kittens in the other. Here I am, bag and baggage, she said briskly. Mother sent her love and was glad if I could do anything for you. Meg wanted me to bring some of her blanc mange. She makes it very nice, and Beth thought her cats would be comforting. I knew you'd shout at them, but I couldn't refuse. She was so anxious to do something. It so happened that Beth's funny loan was just the thing, for in laughing over the kids, Laurie forgot his bashfulness and grew sociable at once. That looks too pretty to eat, he said, smiling with pleasure, as Joe uncovered the dish and showed the blanc mange, surrounded by a garland of green leaves and the scarlet flowers of Amy's pet geranium. Isn't, it isn't anything, only they all felt kindly and wanted to show it. Tell the girl to put it away for your tea. It's so simple, you can eat it, and being soft, it will slip down without hurting your sore throat. What a cozy room this is. It might be if it was kept nice, but the maids are lazy and I don't know how to make them mind. Worries me though. I'll write it up in two minutes, for it only needs to have the hearth brushed. So, and the things stood straight on the mantelpiece, so, and the books put here, the bottles there, and your sofa turned from the light and the pillows plumped up a bit. Now then, you're fixed. And so he was. For, as she laughed and talked, Joe had whisked things into place and given quite a different air to the room. Laurie watched her in respectful silence, and when she beckoned him to his sofa, he sat down with a sigh of satisfaction, saying gratefully, How kind you are. Yes, that's what it wanted. Now, please take the big chair and let me do something to amuse my company. No, I came to amuse you. Shall I read aloud? And Joe looked affectionately towards some, inv some inviting books nearby. Thank you, I've read all those. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk, asked, answered Laurie. Not a bit, I'll talk all day if you'll only set me going. Beth says I never know when to stop. Is Beth the rosy one who stays at home a good deal and sometimes goes out with a little basket, asked Laurie with interest. Yes, that's Beth. She's my girl and a regular good one she is too. The pretty one is Meg and the curly haired one is Amy, I believe. How did you find that out? Laurie colored up, but answered frankly. Why, you see, I often hear you calling to one another, and when I'm alone up here, I can't help looking over at your house. You always seem to be having such good times. I beg your pardon for being so rude, but sometimes you forget to pull down the curtain at the window where the flowers are, and when the lamps are lighted, it's like looking at a picture to see the fire, and you all round the table with your mother, her face is right opposite, and it looks so sweet behind the flowers. I can't help watching it. I haven't got any mother, you know, said Laurie. Laurie por he poked the fire to hide a little twitching of the lip that he could not control. The solitary, hungry look in his eyes went straight to Joe's warm heart. She had been so simply taught that there was no nonsense in her head, and at 15 she was as innocent and frank as any child. Laurie was sick and lonely, and feeling how rich she was in home love and in home love and happiness, she gladly tried to share it with him. Her brown face was very friendly, and her sharp voice unusually gentle, as she said, We'll never draw that curtain any more, and I give you leave to look as much as you like. I just wish, though, instead of peeping, that you'd come over and see us. Mother is so splendid, she'd do you heaps of good and Beth would sing to you if I begged her to, and Amy would dance, Meg and I would make you laugh over our funny stage properties, and we'd have jolly times. Wouldn't your grandpa let you? 
I think he would, if your mother asked him. He's very kind, though he don't look it. And he lets me do what I like, pretty much. Only he's afraid I might be a bother to strangers, began Laurie, brightening more and more. We ain't strangers, we're neighbors, and you didn't, you needn't think you'd be a bother. We want to know you. I've been trying to do it this ever so long. <laughs> we haven't been here a great while. You know, but we have got acquainted with all our neighbors but you. You see, Grandpa lives among his books, and don't mind much what happens outside. Mr. Brook, my tutor, don't stay here, you know. I have, I have no one to go round with me, so I just stop at home and get on as I can. That's bad. You ought to make a dive and go visiting everywhere you are asked. Then you'll have lots of friends and pleasant places to go. Never mind being bashful. It won't last long if you keep going. Laurie turned red again, but wasn't offended at being accused of bashfulness. For there was so much goodwill in Joe, it was impossible not to take her blunt speeches as kindly as they were meant. Do you like your school? asked the boy, changing the subject. After a little pause, during which she stared at the fire and Joe looked about her well pleased. Don't go to school. I'm a businessman. Oh, <clears throat> I'm a businessman, girl. I mean, I go to wait on my aunt and a dear cross old soul she is too, answered Joe. Lori opened his mouth to ask another question, but remembering just in time that it wasn't manners to make too many inquiries into people's affairs, he shut it again and looked uncomfortable. Joe liked his good breeding and didn't mind having a laugh at Aunt March, so she gave him a lively description of the fidgety old lady, her fat poodle, the parrot that talked Spanish, and the library where she reveled. Lori enjoyed that immensely, and when she told him about the prim old gentleman who came once, a, came once to woo Aunt March, and in the middle of a fine speech how Pole had tweaked, tweaked his wig off to his great dismay, the boy lay back and laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks, and the maid popped her head in to see what was the matter. Oh, that does me lots of good. Tell on, please, he said, taking his face out of the sofa cushion red and shining with merriment. Much elated with her success, Joe did tell on about their plays and plans, their hopes and fears for father, and the most interesting events of the little world in which the sisters lived. Then they got to talking about books, and to Joe's delight, she found that Laurie loved them as well as she did, and had read even more than herself. If you like them so much, come down and see ours. <clears throat> Oh, this is Laurie talking. If you like them so much, come down and see ours. Grandpa is out, so you needn't be afraid, said Laurie, getting up. Not afraid of anything, returned Joe with a toss of the head. I don't believe you are, exclaimed the boy, looking at her with much admiration, though he privately thought that she would have good reason to be a trifle afraid of the old gentleman if she met him in some of his moods. The atmosphere of the whole house being summer-like, Laurie led the way from room to room, letting Joe stop to examine whatever struck her fancy. And so at last they came to the library, where she clapped her hands and pranced, as she always did when especially delighted. It was lined with books, and there were pictures and statues and distracting little cabinets full of coins and curiosities, and sleepy hollow chairs, and queer tables and bronzes, and best of all, a great open fireplace with quaint tiles all around it. What richness, sighed Joe, sinking into the depths of a velvet chair and gazing about her with an air of intense satisfaction. Theodore Lawrence, you ought to be the happiest boy in the world, she added impressively. A fellow can't live on books, said Laurie, shaking his head as he perched on a table opposite. Before he could say more, a bell rung and Joe flew up, exclaiming with alarm, oh, Mercy me, it's your grandpa. Well, what if it is? You're not afraid of anything, you know, returned the boy, looking wicked. I think I am a little bit afraid of him, but I don't know why I should be. Marmy said I might come, and I don't think you're any the worse for it, said Joe, composing herself, though she kept her eyes on the door. I'm a great deal better for it, and ever so much obliged. If only afraid, I'm only afraid you're very tired of talking to me. It was so pleasant. I couldn't bear to stop, said Laurie gratefully. The doctor, to see you, sir, so, and the maid beckoned as she spoke. Would you mind if I left you for a minute? I suppose I must see him, said Laurie. Don't mind me. I'm as happy as a cricket here, answered Joe. 
And that is the end for this section of chapter five. We will read the next half next time. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us and we'll see you then.